Hello, welcome. In this video, as you can tell right here, we're going to look at inverse functions. Specifically, I want to cover one-to-one -one functions, what they are and why they're so important. I want to cover the definitions of them and also basic notation. And I want to look at arrow diagrams, very useful in functions and their inverses. And I also want to review the horizontal line test, what it is and why it works, which is very similar in its idea for the vertical line test. So let's get started. So let's talk about one-to-one -one functions first. One-to-one -one functions are functions that actually have inverses. They have inverses. That's, that's why we look at them. That's why they're so important here. Now, if a function is not one-to-one, -one, you can cut it up or restrict the domain so it does have an inverse, but we'll get to that later. The idea of a one-to-one -one function is that it's a function where each input has one output. Each input has one output. Now, that's true for all functions. You might want to make a note of that. But what's also true about one-to-one -one functions is that each output has one input. And that's why they're reversible. Each output has one input. It goes both ways. So, for example, just to show this clearly, let's look at a one-to-one -one function, and then we'll look at a non a function that's not one-to-one. -one. So a one-to-one -one function, as an example, we'll say f of x equals 3x plus 2. And for our non-one-to-one one-to-one -one function, not one-to-one -one function. We'll look at a quadratic, we'll call it g of x, and we'll say it equals x squared. So the one-to-one -one function, let's assume we start with the inputs negative one, zero, and one. If we plug them in and run them through f, we're tripling them and adding two, we get negative one, two, and five. And each of these inputs corresponds to one output. That fits the definition. But if we were to try and reverse it, in other words, if we're trying, trying to find the inverse, we could say that, all right, negative 1 goes back to only negative 1, so it's reversible. 2 goes back to only 0, so we know where it goes. And 5 only goes back to 1. In other words, it goes in both directions, that, that oneness. And that's not true for a function that's not one-to-one. -one. Let's say we're plugging in the same inputs into, our, into this parabola. Negative 1. 0 and 1. Well, the outputs would be 1, 0, and then 1 again. Because 0 goes to 0, but both negative 1 squared and 1 squared go to 1. And now if we try and reverse this, we're going to have a problem. If you start at 0, you know exactly which input you started from. But if you started at 1 as the output, where do we go? Do we go back there or there? Which of these inputs gave us that output? We don't know. In other words, it's not a reversible function. And that's why the horizontal line test is also so useful. If we look at the graphs of a basic linear function, in this case you said 3x plus 2, so I'll make the y-intercept here, and let's just imagine that's accurate. This is our function f. If we drew a horizontal line across really any point of this function, it would only cross once. So for example, if I have it cross at the y-intercept here, at 2, it only crosses it once there, and that tells you that there's only one input that has that height. And that's what the horizontal line test does in general. You draw a horizontal line, and if it only crosses once, it's a one-to-one -one function. If it crosses more than once, it's not one-to-one. -one. And we'll look at the parabola to understand why. So if you just drew the parabola really quick, rough sketch, it's our function g, and we analyze what happens at 1. So if I draw a horizontal line there, this, this function fails the horizontal line test. It tells you it's not 1 to 1. If I plug in 1 or negative 1, I get a height of 1. So it shows you that there are two inputs, in this case, 1 and negative 1, have the same output. And again, outputs are at the same height, which is why we draw horizontal lines. So we've got all of this stuff here, right? We've got some basic things to look at, the arrow diagrams. And what we'll cover in depth as we go forward is a little bit more about how to work with this.
the nice thing about these functions and function notation is that we can quickly write them. So for example, with the function g of x, which equals 3x plus 2, we write the inverse of the function. In this case, we'll talk about it in the next video or so. The inverse of this function would be x minus 2 over 3. But look at the notation here. When you see that little negative 1, what that's telling you is it's the inverse of g. This is the, why did I write g? I called it f. I think originally I wanted to call it g, but let me just fix that. This is f of x, and this is the inverse of f. Let me re-highlight that. This is, sorry, the inverse of the function f. So a little notation right there, negative one, that indicates an inverse. Be aware, f to the negative one x is not an exponent, does not equal one over f of x. And I know that's confusing. It's because if you usually see a negative exponent, it means the reciprocal, right? And that's true when we're dealing with exponents, but we're dealing with inverses. And frankly, we sometimes just run out of convenient notation. And this is where you start to see some of that overlap. So if you see that little negative one with a function, you're talking about inverses, not exponents. Thanks.